Forrest from University of Georgia. Uh, and I don't know if your official title is Extension, extension Specialist, but uh, Extension in Program Coordinator. I like that one better. Program yes. Coordinator uh, for the Bugwood product, Project. And I'm very interested because as a, as a former ag teacher who still works with agriculture teachers, these are the types of images uh, I was working with or looking for for years because uh, we were still using an older one uh, that was no longer in print. And so this was intriguing to me. Uh, but I would, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce uh, the book. Thank you. And how Cornell's engaged in it. And I'm, I'm very excited about this. This is something that we started doing some of this expansion about three or four years ago. Um, realizing that out of University of Georgia, we can do quite a few things. But if we try to go it alone, it's going to be a scary, scary world. And so I have the great pleasure today to discuss a lot of what we do and how Cornell is going to be playing a large role in some of our future activities. Um, I come from an extension background. I did my bachelor's and double master's at Ohio State University. Very strong in extension there. And I love the idea of having people whose job it is to take research-based information and take it to the people who need it the most. This is one of the best things we can do to make sure that if we're going to spend all this money on research, someone actually has a clue about how to apply it in the field. And as most extension agents will tell you, keep it simple. You need something that's just going to grab them and go, this is what you do to get better yields, get better pest control, and really get, get what's going on in the field. And as long as there has been extension in education, images have been key to that. An image does far more for you in showing what something is than trying to describe what it could possibly be and resolves a lot of uncertainty that comes up. And so you have this need for good images out there. You have to have <laughs> stuff that is actually in focus, good exposure, and you can actually show it to someone and they go, yes, that is exactly what it is. And you also have to have all the information that goes with that image. And that's something that gets overlooked a little bit, but if you don't have information you can rely on to say this is what this is supposed to be, then the picture is kind of useless. And the last thing you need is you need to have it easily available. If I can't get my fingers on it in a matter of minutes, I'm going to be really disappointed in the end product of what I'm working on, or at least frustrated in the process of building some tools. And so we had the era of film, which I caught the very tail end of. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a young pup in the group. So it's been interesting to see the professors that I worked with, their massive slide collections. Uh, my advisor, David Sidner, I swear he had over 100,000 slides in cabinets. And you pulled it out. And here are all the labels and everything. Beautiful collections, beautiful list of everything that's in there. And you had a lot of sharing and trading going on. Guys taking their collections around, passing them around, and really trying to deliver some of this information. It got to be challenging keeping track of the authorship. And we've dealt with this quite a bit with um, slide collections that come in. And you look at a slide, and you see a name written on the border. Well, is that the name of the person's collection that is now residing in? Is that the original photographer? And we start tracking back some of these pictures to the original slide, and you can tell a duplicate from the original, and go, this is who the original person was, and here's their original information. What we started finding with some of the different films, you start getting degradation of the film, and things start to break down over time. And speaking of things breaking down over time, you eventually have faculty members that want to retire. Imagine that. And so you have these great collections that pass from one generation to the next, a legacy being passed down through a lot of the programs at our land grant universities. And unfortunately, in many cases, these are legacies lost. That either through degradation of the film, so that the pictures really aren't worth that much anymore, or more frequently, loss of the information. The only person that knew what this slide was of is now dead. And we're sitting here with a bunch of pictures that are beautiful pictures, but we no longer have what we need to use them anymore. 
And so a lot of things with computers coming online, being available, being able to scan these slides became very important. That you had all these different technologies that you could draw on. And as time progressed, technology got better. It got cheaper to be able to do a lot of this work. And it started making some new issues for us that you have these increased opportunities for sharing that I can take last drive and I can give you thousands of photos on it. How do you track the authorship? How important is it to make sure all the information stays with those photos? And then you bring out the internet and it kind of hits the fan and people start getting concerned about many things um, in terms of sharing their photos and everything else. I do like to bring up Gollum now and again that there are photographers that I run across who their slides are their precious. It is what they hold above all else and if I ever let this out of my hands, I will never get my hands back on it. It'll be used everywhere and I won't get credit and I won't get paid and I won't get recognition and it's for them it is something they obsess over. Now. I fully realize there are photographers out there that are professional photographers. This is how they make their living. And they should be able to charge for their work. But they're also, for extension and for educational purposes, needs to be some flexibility. We need the ability to be able to share some things so that we can get the information out to people who need it. Extension programs don't have a large budget. We need to find ways to effectively do things so that we can all benefit from the resources that are out there. Finding that nice moderation point between someone can still make a living and we have the resources available, something I'm still working on with all of our photographers in the Bugwood Image Database. So organizing digital images. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then an interface is worth a thousand pictures. If you can't find it quickly, it might as well not be there. There's been a lot of technology that have come along that have made it really easy to type in a few keywords and immediately get back a response. And this is very, very useful, especially with the internet, because you have open accessibility anywhere you go. Whether you're using Flickr or Picasa or the Bugwood Image Database or anything else, if I want a picture of me on summer vacation and I'm up here, I can get on the internet and find it. There's a question, though, about a universal fit. Organizing images requires a purpose. Why are you organizing them? Because you're going to have to think, how are people going to want to retrieve this information later? I don't think there is one universal fit for everything that's out there. Bugwood Image Database works very well for a lot of different disciplines, living things, non-living things, great stuff for agriculture. If you're trying to do your family genealogy, it's not going to work. If you're trying to do PR campaigns and show people at different gatherings, it is weak in that area and does not do a good job. It has a specific purpose that we try to follow. So what is this Bugwood image database I keep talking? Well, um, most of you have been in entomology or plant pathology for a while. Yes, maybe, possibly. You can raise your hand, I won't. Okay. You've noticed that people aren't very creative in naming insects, or plants, or diseases. Bug wood. An entomologist and a forester started a project together. That's it. That is the only significance to that name. They said, let's make a freely available resource of images so that if you're working on a non-commercial project, take it, use it, please. Just make sure you cite it when you're done. So citing it, photographer, organization, and bugwood.org. Because the photographer and the organization are really supporting some great work out there. And the photographer did the work in taking the photo. Bugwood.org did the job in organizing things so you can find it. Bugwood does not, and I cannot stress this enough, does not claim any rights on the photos. They are the property of the photographer. If the photographer comes to me and says, take my pictures down, the answer is yes, sir. Why? And then we deal with it from there to find out how we can come to an understanding. It is dated 
base driven and searchable, so you can get through it in a lot of different ways. But more importantly, it's actually taxonomically based. Where we can, we fall back on Linnaeus, because he is a wonderful, wonderful guy. And he has done a great job of putting things in some um, good hierarchies. But we also develop hierarchies for other things in the database. So you can drill down logically through what you're looking at to find the images you need. We also do a lot to control our vocabularies because if we started keywording everything, which is a wonderful technique for some things, you start getting some misspellings and other things that come into it that really make it hard to find what photos you're looking for. And we try to base everything in the system on capturing the photographer's intent. They took the picture for a reason. We are not going for a Rorschach here. We're not going, well, that could be a bunny. That could be a go, and maybe it could be uh, Queen Elizabeth. No. There is a specific purpose why a picture was taken. This was taken to show some of the pythons that they're collecting down in Florida, and that these things grow to significant size, and so this is put in under the python. Pictures like this get to be a little fuzzier, that you look at it and go, is it the sidewalk? Is it the girl? What is it? This is where the interaction with a photographer helps out. But this is actually lightning damage on oak. This oak over here was hit with lightning, and so you see stunting compared to the one that had been planted at the same time. That's where interaction with the photographer to really capture their intent comes into it. A um, little dirty secret about Bugwood Image Database. Um, it has many, many, many faces because there is one image database, but we have a wide variety of clientele that come to that image database for things. And so we've given it different faces to start your navigation, because then you'll go in at different points. So forestryimages.org is designed as a forester would think, with silvicultural practices, some of the urban forestry, wildlife, and some of that put in the main part of it for them to drill through. Insect images. These people tend to go with how the insect feeds or the taxonomy to get to the pictures they're looking for. IPM images, commodity based. So if you're working in agriculture or any of those fields, going in through here shows you what commodity you're in when you start drilling down through the pictures. Weedimages.org, which I always gets a few snickers. Um, the Weed Science Society of America said, we'd like to work with you on a project. And we said, OK. They gave us their list of weeds. Here is their list of weeds that we have pictures of. It's a list of about 3,000 things. We have pictures for about 1,700 of them. So we're doing, uh, trying to fill some of that out. And they also wanted to highlight symptomology of herbicides. So all right, we can build this site to go in through that particular uh, avenue. And then invasive.org built around invasive species lists that different groups put out, saying this is a problem in our area. And so we put this together and compiled lists of those species so that you can drill through things that in one place or another has been a problem. So in all these disciplines, and it's a wide area to work in, we don't like to you know, box ourselves in too much, we have images featuring the good guys when things go well in the field. This is an example from South Georgia, cotton field. Don't see too many of these up here. Uh, the bad guys. This is a weed, palm ramaranth, that has developed ALS and Roundup resistance. Kind of a little bit of a problem down there. And so you can actually reduce yield in cotton quite considerably. The bystander, something you see in a field and you go, OK, is that damaging my crop or not? just so a farmer can have some relief when they look through the pictures. Plus, management path practices, control and production, uh, so you can see what these things look like in the field. And we even put some research in there, because it's important to highlight those research images so that someone could use this in this presentation to say, look at these things that are going on out there that are going to help us in the future. So when the first site, Forestry Images, released in 2001, there were 3,500 images, a small set of images from the Southern Forest Insect Work Conference. 
we've grown considerably in the last 11 years. Um, actually 17 since we started, but 11 years since online. We now have 156,000 images covering a fair number of uh, subjects, about 16,000 at this point. And in the past year, looking at the detail page for any one image, we've had 20 million hits. People go to it a lot to just see what information there is about a picture. But then also we've had 11,000 image use requests for about 46,000 images. And there's actually been 80,000 direct downloads of the images in the system. Um, this is actually not representative of a year because we just started tracking that. It's something we kind of overlooked in some of the early design. So there's a lot of traffic coming to these sites to really use the images that are there. And so a little bit I'm going to go into now is about how we organize these sites to allow people to drill down to what they're looking for. <coughs> I'm going to start on forestry images. And I'm going to go into the discipline of urban forestry there in the middle. By going there, I've gone to a submenu where we had some more breakouts of different things like tree defects, different types, arboricultural practices. I'm actually, because uh, I'm an entomologist, just can't help it. Uh, I'm going to go down and look at some of the urban plant health problems under insects. And so this takes me to a page with all the pictures of insects we have that are affecting ornamental trees. So there's a lot in here and you go, that's a picture of a stump grinder. Why do you have a picture of a stump grinder associated with insects on ornamental trees? Because the descriptor on this is a control. For southern pine beetle, grinding out the stump to make sure you're getting rid of all the insects that are down there in the flare that didn't get removed is a control method. So, all right, we don't want all of that. Let me look over on the sidebar, and we have descriptors, adult, damage, larvae. Let me just see pictures you have of insect larvae. Okay, so here's all pictures of that. Okay, well, I took an extension course at one point, and I think I remember what this is. And so I can go in by taxonomy and say, I only want to see pictures of Lepidoptera larvae. Selecting that, you reduce things down a little further, and you start looking at this going, you know what, this guy looks a heck of a lot like what I have in my hand. Clicking on that takes you to that image detail page, and now you have all the information about this particular picture. You have options to navigate through the taxonomy for it, also go to more pictures by the photographer or pictures at the organization. And you can say, well, I think this might be it, but I want to see more pictures of these, of hickory horn devils. So you click that link, and it takes you to all 43 images we have of hickory horn devil. So now you can browse through it and see kind of, you know, what's out there for it and see if it really does match what's in your hand. We also have an information tab that's available. Uh, we were on thumbnails, going over to information, showing taxonomic rank, references of where we got our names from, and some links out to other systems. This is really minimal for hickory horned devil. Hickory horned devil, yes, occasionally is found. People find it pretty cool with the horns on the top. And that's about where that stops. For something more like Kelgar grass, federal noxious weed, we have a little more information on this page. We've got a description that was written by our staff, a link out to some other sources. Um, for Kogon grass, we have about 230 odd pictures of it, which is a little oppressive to look through. So here we picked our top 12. This is a set that if you want to, you can grab, throw in your light box, and you're ready to go with our set of images we think are the best for Kogon grass. You've got some different maps. Occurrence data from the uh, early detection and distribution mapping system. State regulated lists, what states have this on their list. And also some data from WSSA about where it's a trouble or common, common weed. Um, also, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center provided us a web service. <laughs> web service. Yeah to show native alternatives so we can see what, some, what, what could be planted as opposed to this. And then here is the listing of all the people who said, yeah, this thing's a problem where we are. So you don't have to take our word for it that it's invasive. Here are the listing sources of where it's a problem. And then you also have taxonomic rank, links out to other systems, 
synonyms for it, both scientific and common name, and your references for where we get a lot of the information. So just a whole lot more dynamic uh, and useful content for something that's uh, higher importance. Going back to this image detail page, a lot of stuff revolves around this. Because if you want to now use this picture, you think you like it, you want to use it, well, if you just want to directly download it, if you're not signed in, you can at least get the PowerPoint version. If you sign in and getting an account is free, you can get the big versions. But if you're working on a project and want to download them as a batch, you can add it to your Lightbox. And it says, all right, you just added this to your Lightbox. What do you want to do next? And so I'm going to say I want to request use and download all the images in this particular batch. So we ask the person, what are you using it for? And notice, they have use type right up here. If someone marks personal or educational use, they're going to get permission to use it, because that's why the system was set up. When they mark commercial, we then go to, how did the, the contact for these images tell us to handle that? Oftentimes, you forward it on to them. They do whatever they want to do with it. If they want to charge money for commercial use, God bless them. They put some more information in here, they submit their request, and they instantly get a report coming back saying, all right, these have been forwarded on to the photographer, this was approved, this one, yeah, it was rejected, you're not going to get permission for that, and these other ones were approved. You then have options to download the citations and information in Excel, uh, get a PowerPoint presentation with the image and the citation already on it or get the zip file for all the images. So here, please, go use them now that you've requested what you want. So good tools for users to be able to grab something and take and use it. We've then been working on different ways to give photographers better recognition. Without photographers in our system, we don't have a system. And so we've been developing photographer profile pages. Who here has not graduated yet? Who here wants a job when they graduate? <laughs> okay. When you apply for a job, I can tell you if you applied anywhere that I worked, first thing we do is we Google your name to see where you come up. We are indexed by Google. If you come up and you have a fair amount of work down here that people say, oh, look, they've actually submitted some very good quality images. It helps build your reputation so people see some of the work you've done and it, it really does make a good first impression. Also for the photographer, because they have all the same sorting on the side, anywhere you go, your pictures are available to you. And they're yours, so by all means, use them. We've also been doing some work to get better credit for the organizations. So that from any given organization, here is their page for the brief description link going off to their home page, and then all the work that the organization has provided um, for posting in the, in the image database. Um, we started building a better home for where a lot of these tools end up residing. And there's no www, it's just images.bugwood.org. Pretty straightforward. There we have our first tool, which for upload images, We've tried to make it real simple. You throw some pictures down in the box down here. It only accepts JPEGs. You can include documents too. And you send the pictures off to University of Georgia or Cornell University for them to look at these images and work on putting them into the system. Now, I will give you one caveat with this. If they're related to a project that either of the, any of these groups are working on, they're going to go in a lot faster. So talking with them and finding out what they're working on would be a very good idea. But we often get contributions that are unsolicited, and I go, OK, when I have time, I will work on that. And they slowly work their way into the system. Um, we also have some things to show use and impact under uh, statistics over on this side. Everyone loves a good report. These are two reports you run on number of uh, uh, times an image has been directly downloaded and number of views. Um, so for me, 
My stop sign with two invasive species at the bottom is number one for direct downloads. And I don't know why, but my goat is number one for being viewed. Um, never hurts to have a diversity of things up there, but that's what happens. Um, one thing I will point out at this point, you'll notice this one has a UGA on it, a black tag in the corner, seven digit number. This one does not have a UGA on it. This is the old tag we used to use. And when I was at Ohio State, I was naive. I thought UGA was an alphanumeric series in order to extend the numbering. <laughs> that was University of Georgia. Um, we realized that Florida and others were not really pleased with that, especially depending on who won the championship. So the UGA has been dropped off those tags. Um, we're working to make them a little less noticeable in the next revision. We've also done some work so that when people make requests, all that information they've entered, you get to see it. So if you're working on your annual report or just want to, want to feel good and warm and fuzzy, you can look down through here and see who's requested to use what and what project they're looking at. The last group of tools that we've actually been building help both photographers and users of the system, which is our image recruiting. Um, the idea that it's sometimes hard to get word out there that I'm working on a project and I need pictures of this. And so we started doing some things that people send us a list of what they want and I put it in the system. And this adds things up and says, well, this particular species we have no pictures of and it's on top because it's been requested the most. People keep sending me that organism in lists. And so this is what we really need pictures of. If you go to any particular list, you can actually sort it to see how many pictures they have of each of these things. And so if you're really passionate about pests not known to occur in North America, you can help them out and say, oh, I've got pictures of these. I can help that project along. For people who are working on projects, they can post these lists and hopefully photographers see things and then start posting pictures up to them. When pictures are posted into the system, the owner of the project actually gets emails saying, hey, we have a new picture of something you care about. The links for these go directly into the image database so you can see what the picture looks like. So it makes it a pretty small email. It makes it pretty easy to manage new stuff coming in. And then we give some extra tools to the person who owns this project, which start appearing over here when they're signed in. They've got the ability to select a group of pictures just by dragging and dropping them over to their selected image box. They can then drag them around and put them in order, add captions onto all the different images, and then have them delivered out to whatever website they're working on by web service. So you don't have to download the pictures. You don't have to do anything with the captions. Our system stores all that for you. Here it is. Go use it next step I'm working on is a universal request button. You finish up your project, hit request, it goes through everything you've selected, makes one request for your entire project, and then you start getting back the results. So this Cornell node thing, I started with, well, I was so excited about it. The idea is to use regional expertise to better serve the needs of the Northeast. We're in Georgia. I came up here, your high is my low in temperature. It was 76. It was cozy. It's cold up here. Things are a little different depending where you go. This is the map of the National Plant Diagnostic Network regions. And because I work with them quite a bit, it's the map I tend to use for a lot of things. University of Georgia, we are not in Athens. We are in Tifton. Pretty far down there. If you're on I-75 and 64 miles from Florida, you are in Tifton. We also have Colorado State University, who came on to bring a Western, uh, Great Plains perspective into a lot of the work we're doing. And now we're proud to accept Cornell into this, to bring the Northeast perspective into what we're doing. To have feedback not only on the images that are coming in, but also how our interfaces work to make them work better for the commodities associated with the Northeast. There are also two other groups which aren't really regional. 
Uh, one is the International Society of Arboriculture. Has anyone heard of that before? Okay. They work with us to get a lot of stuff about trees and tree care into the system and make sure it's fitting what they'd expect. And then IDPIC is actually USDA Plant Protection and Quarantine CFIS. I can't remember the rest of the acronym, who is developing a lot of tools to help people screening things coming in the country. They've built a lot of keys that are very image heavy. All of those images are coming into this system and will be available soon. And that's going to be a, well, a very, very lovely resource. So the question comes up, well, why do you need a node? If you've built this image database, you've built these upload forms, I can enter information when I upload it, why do you even need a node? The answer is, we like to make things look push button easy. You want it to look really easy to get what you want. Unfortunately, in order to make that work, here's what happens behind the scenes. In order to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. This, I see most of you glazing over already, is not what you want to deal with. And so we have a node to keep it like this. So that as far as you're concerned, you upload images, you give them some information, magic happens, and it's available online in the way you'd expect. Cornell has quite a few members that are going to be working with this. And Molly Swartwood is going to be leading up a lot of these efforts for data entry. Um, she's working with Karen Snowbercliffe, Rachel McCarthy, uh, Don Daly O'Brien, Sandra Jensen, and Karen Scott to help organize a lot of this information and work through it. Um, it's going to be a very interesting project and a lot of fun to see how this all sorts out. The initial work is being funded by a regional IPM project. Um, they were kind enough to partially fund the grant. And so they're going to start working with collections within the plant pathology group and the pest disease information system, which is part of uh, a larger system that helps coordinate diagnostic labs in the country. They have an archive of a fair number of images. They're going to sort through that and get those added. The future of this is that as long as someone is here at Cornell that knows the system, we see no reason to shut off access. Um, we're going to keep the systems up and running down in Georgia. Stuff's welcome to be added. If you guys have staff time or have someone with a real interest, it's available. And so by working together, we're really hoping to support IPM practitioners, stop invasive species, protect world agriculture, defect, defend the way of life of people all over the world. We're trying to do our best to make agriculture successful. And by building in resources within the Northeast region and coordinating among regions, I think we're going to do that pretty well. So at this point, I will stop for questions. I think, yes, we have some a little bit of time. Um, before we go to that, this is my email address. You are welcome to email me. Um, I will attempt to respond quickly. This is Molly's. <coughs> She's sitting in the back right there in the red. So you're welcome to harass her. Just don't tackle her when she's walking down the hallway. So, questions? Uh, so who, who uh, is the gatekeeper for the accuracy of the information? Um, I saw one of your pictures was of uh, heterovicity and the nosome root rot, and that name is now changed. So who goes in and makes that change in the system? or conversely, who checks to be sure it's right to begin with? Um, two answers, because you asked two questions, actually. The first one, uh, who goes in to make that change? Right now, the way the system's set up, it's me. So I get an email from George, uh, and he says, the name has changed. It is now this. I go online, I look up references from Index Fungorum, American Phytopath, and other sources to verify that what George just told me is true. Not that I don't believe George. He's pretty knowledgeable. What I need is a reference. Because as you were seeing on the bottom of a lot of the information pages, I put a reference for where our taxonomy comes from. <coughs> so it's not us being the sage on the stage saying, hey, I know what this is. 
we're referencing someone else. And so I need to look that up and make that change. We are looking to actually put an interface online for that so that someone at Cornell could see a name and say, no, I want to contest this name. This is wrong. It's no longer in use. And so when that happens, we'll end up contacting the last person who made the change, notifying them, saying, do you have anything to say about this? And if there's going to be a discussion about that, we'll have it and then resolve what it is. Some things are cut and dry. They change the name, all right, we're done. Other things, if I have to have another fight over white and yellow clover, I'm going to hurt somebody because it keeps going back and forth. Some people want to split it. Some people want to lump it. It, it drives you nuts. And so keeping up on scientific taxonomy especially is uh, definitely a challenge and something we have to look into. In terms of your next question of when the stuff initially goes in, whose responsibility is to make sure that information is accurate? Part of it is the people doing the data entry. So myself, people here at Cornell, people in Colorado. And we'll get picture coming in, we'll look at it, and we'll look at who the photographer is. If Whitney Cranshaw, Colorado State, he's an entomologist, sends me a picture, and it, it's of a bug, most times I'll take his word for it, because he's pretty well known. He does a good job of identifying things. I have some other photographers who are photographers, not biologists. When they send me stuff, I take it with a grain of salt. And I may look up a few things online to see if I can find any other pictures that actually match that. Um, with us, after a while, you get to know your photographers pretty well, especially the ones that are active contributors. And so you start getting a feel of where they know their stuff and where they may be pulling your leg. Um, what I tell anyone who contributes to the system, only identify it to the level you're comfortable. If you can only identify this to the family level, that's where I'm going to classify it in the system. Don't make a guess down to species because you feel you have to. Stop it where you know. It's a constant challenge to update everything. Um, we provided some good tools to allow it to happen. I get emails all the time. This picture you have of this, I don't think it's this. And so the first step on that, I email the photographer, say so-and-so says this about the picture. What do you think? Sometimes they reply back, yeah, you're right, I missed that one. Other times they reply back and say, oh, the reason the coloration was off on that particular thing, that insect had just molted. And so it hadn't fully darkened yet. And so then we edit our descriptions to better reflect what was featured in the image so it gets rid of that uncertainty. It gets to be a lot of fun keeping up on all of that. Um, when all else fails and I can't reach the photographer, I have a dispute about something, the image gets pulled down. It goes in the, there is a dispute about this file. It doesn't become public again until somebody resolves that dispute. Best I can do about that. Other questions? Students, don't be shy. <laughs> It may not be a class for a grade, but you know, participation is good. <laughs> I can't believe I've explained things so clearly. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and put my teacher hat on. But as you explained that light box, if they register, then they could actually pull those images and compile. Like we're talking about for contest, where we're going to get a specific list. They could compile uh, uh, something they could then print out and use. Is that the way I'm understanding what you were discussing the, the registration process of getting access to that white box? Yes, yeah, so anyone can go on to any of the sites and create an account. That account works on any of the other sites because I hate having multiple usernames and passwords. Um, you then sign in and you start picking pictures in your white box. For what you described, I would not necessarily make a one request 
to get, especially if I want to share that with other people. A feature I didn't mention was the ability to add these images to a collection. That collection, I can then send that URL to whoever I want, and they can view the pictures I selected. And the wonderful thing about that on top of the collection is add these images to your light box. So if you, as the organizer for FFA, are trying to get this set distributed, you say, here, the, here is the collection of pictures I have selected. Just click this button, and you can make a request to download them for your project. And that'll get it to them as fast as possible. Uh, the nice thing about that is the collection stays on your account. So if you go up to your account, you can view your collections. You can then edit your collection for the next year, change the pictures out. The link that, they, that you sent them before, it's the same link. It never changes. So it's a nice way to update content without having to send out new information every time. Is there any place along the line where users uh, uh, agree, at least in principle, to acknowledge the provider of the image or, or agree not to edit out the code number or any of this kind of stuff? Um, where that, there's no place where they check a box saying, I agree to all the stipulations on the website. The website has all the usage policies there, and they are supposed to agree to them. That would be an interesting thing to add. Um, I will correct one thing, that leaving that code number on the bottom is not a requirement for use, nor is it a replacement for the citation. We don't care if you crop that image. Crop that tag off all you want. It is ugly. I don't care who you are, it's ugly. Crop it off, use the picture. What is important is the citation. The photographer and their organization deserve the credit. And we'd like some credit for help getting you to where you needed to be to get the picture. So that's we should look into having something that you, you say, yes, I, I will agree to this. Can I just add to that, Joe? Um, what I've done sometimes, George, with mine is, because um, as somebody who does a lot of design stuff and edits for a national newsletter, I'll trim the black box out. But if it's something, people are able to find that image immediately if you do have that number. So sometimes I will type in after bugwood.org Exactly, exactly what that number is. So if somebody needs to go find that exact image, they can find it quickly, especially for some that have a lot of um, the same topic. That's one way that I've sort of you know, gotten around. And most times that number, either in our search or in Google, returns the picture. And you go, oh, there it is, with all the information. Um, like I said, I'm working on a different way put a black box down there and not affect the original image. It's getting to be fun, but I think I can work it out. I have another question. We have, as you know, or you will by the end of this week, we have some rather significant photographic collections here at Cornell in our herbarium and individual collections alike. My understanding is that when we approached the library to, our Cornell library to uh, be the repository for our one of our major photographic collections. They wanted something like a ten thousand dollar entry fee and then a three thousand dollar a year maintenance fee. What what is all this costing? To, and who's paying the bill? And what happens if the if the funding stream gets turned off? Good questions. Sustainability. I love sustainability. Um, how much is this costing? This got funded through a Northeastern uh, Regional IPM grant. Um, they funded it at quarter, third, of what our original goal okay. was. <laughs> that came back, and from our perspective down in Georgia, the amount of that that we could, I, I, I hate paperwork, 
doing paperwork for small amounts of money um, gets to be difficult, especially for some reason, the smaller amount of money, the more paperwork there is to go with it. I have not figured that out yet. Um, so we said, you know, this is important. We really want in, in a feedback from the Northeast region. So if Cornell can cover my travel up there, then we'll come up, train the staff. I have, I have projects. We are entirely grant funded. I am not on our funds at all. So I have other projects that can support me in the work we're doing here in training the staff. And I have other projects that will support me when Cornell says these particular parts of the interface could really be revamped to do this. Um, as long as we're not talking any major, I'm in pretty good shape. And so, aside from the travel funds, that's all that part's costing. As far as upkeep and keeping all this going, my major concern with this is the data and making sure that when the data comes in, it's done well. We have our own servers. UGA is kind enough to provide us our, IT, our internet connection. We have a number of other projects which serve to make sure our servers are replaced every five years. And so by, you, by using that infrastructure, we're keeping that up and running. Being on grant funds is a funny thing. I know that I have another 18 months of funding. I've known that ever since I started six years ago. From where we've been going, we see a long future for the center at the University of Georgia. We did become a center mainly for the purpose of Dr. Douse and Moorhead are getting old. <coughs> Sorry, Dr. Douse and Moorhead, you are. Um, Dr. Dallas is already retired. Dr. Moorhead will retire at some point. And we didn't want these efforts to go to waste. So the center now exists to continue this work past their retirement. We've been starting to move people into positions in order to, to keep the center going and developing our role within the University of Georgia to be more integral to a, a lot of what they're doing. So I can't give you a good concrete answer what I can say is if it ever came to the point where I know next month I have to shut the lights off, and I will be the one to shut the lights off at this point, uh, we will make arrangements as much as possible to say, do you have a program here that can take this? Or do you have a program here that can take this? And get as much of this content stored in another archive. I don't see that happening given how our program's been going, but I am I don't want to see this ever go away. It's a resource that's desperately needed by extension agents all over. And it's where I'm kind of staking myself at. So that's about the best answer I can give to it. It's not a great one, but it's it's what I got. Well, I, guess, I guess you've answered. I, I, my, I was thinking about things. I wasn't so concerned about the Cornell part of this thing as I was more of the broader, like, what happens when the servers that are currently housed all of this data poop out, and I guess you're yeah. telling me that you've got some agreement with Georgia. Is the stuff that comes through the Cornell node, is there a server here as well, or does it? are we a pass-through to a server that is housed somewhere else? It's all stored in the Bugwood Cloud, which is a set of servers at University of Georgia, regardless of if it's from Colorado, from Cornell, or anything else. We'll keep that system up and running, and so all the tools are available. Um, I will provide the caveat that every once in a while they decide to rework the fiber at University of Georgia, and so we're dark for a day. But the systems are all there. We have other things to help keep the servers up and running in place, and it, it gets to be interesting. I can understand where the library is coming from. Um, in, and there are many cases that we will say to people, <coughs> um, like I have another group that has about a slide collection of about 50,000 slides that they want to add. And I tell them there are two options. 
you can start scanning this with your personnel. I'll give you the settings, go for it, and start trickling that stuff to us as you work on it. And we'll work on it as we have time. Um, aside from that, next time a grant comes up, I'll write it along the lines of getting this collection in because of its importance. And that will go to, if I need to do development on my end, or if we're doing data entry on my end, then we'll do it. If not, then if there's not a whole lot or anything required of the University of Georgia in terms of changing system, there's not a whole lot of reason to pass funds over. It gets to be where you really need our input and training on something that we start talking about, all right, how much is this really going to cost because we have to actually put a body on it for a little while. It gets to be an interesting debate. Um, a lot of what I've been working on recently in the system is making the system more sustainable. Originally, what you saw off of Lightbox was all done by hand. Emails came in and you would go through each email and compile whose image was this, okay, these go in an email to this person. I was spending a quarter of my time working on that. I wrote a system to do it. Now I don't spend any time on it. I can ignore it. So there's a lot of that that goes on and sharing the burden of correcting taxonomy and everything else among the entire group so now one group has to shoulder the entire project. Other questions? I'll try not to be nearly as deep. <laughs> Thank you, Jim.